And the Lord will, even if we are not sure, even here tonight, the Lord's going to impart and download within us a new faith, a new experience of his good gifts that he's a good father. And he does that in concrete ways. One concrete way is through our praise. Another concrete way is the people he brings into our lives. And one of the people he's brought into my life is this man over on my right, Tommy Stewart, from a few years ago over a coffee not far from here. And that has been a great gift to me personally, to this ministry. And anybody who knows Tommy, if you don't, he uh, just does so many things, it's hard to put a, a, a one label on him. But he, he empowers, equips, and encourages God's people and particularly, particularly leaders. And he recognizes that each one of us is a leader. If you're a housewife, a, a husband, if you're a single person, you're, if you're a Christian, then you're a leader. And this man has just been a blessing to me, just confirming the truth of that. Um, he's got his first book out in uh, July, July. So we'll get you back again with your book next time with we'll sign copies, Tommy. Give us the name of the book again. Live and Lead Like Jesus. And I've seen the, the draft of it, a wonderful book. But this man is really just an amazing gift of encouraging people. Uh, I've never met a man who, whose networks across so much of the body of the Lord, across so many organizations, and really gives off his time. Uh, most of what he does, he does for free. And he just encourages people across this whole globe, uh, but particularly in, the, in, this, in this nation. So Tommy, can I welcome you here? Um, and just as Tommy comes to speak, let's allow the Lord, not just that we would hear Tommy's word tonight, because he's going to speak about God of the impossible. Let's allow uh, the Holy Spirit to open our hearts to receive what the Lord would say tonight. So Lord, thank you for your word, your living word. Thank you for, your, for Tommy and Roberta and their family. Lord, thank you for drawing him into our lives, even here tonight. Thank you for your anointing upon him. And Lord, as Tommy speaks, by your spirit, allow each one of us to hear your personal word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Tommy, bless you. Thanks, Fergus. So, uh, I was thinking last weekend just about what I might say tonight, and quite often... When I go to speak in various places, people ask me to share stories as well as speak. And so what I'm going to attempt to do is to speak and to share stories at the same time. Um, and I will want to just come back to the fact that I find myself um, in the service tonight almost sandwiched between two friends. Um, last week, Dr. Cecil Stewart was here. Now, I have to say he has absolutely no relation with mine. Uh, same surname, but no relation. Uh, and next week, um, Dario Leo is speaking, a uh, Presbyterian minister um, who I know very well. Dario serves on the board of Bible Society, uh, which I chair in Northern Ireland. So um, Dario is uh, uh, someone who I've known for some time now as well, and you'll enjoy him uh, next Thursday evening. Um, if I was to be here tonight to give my testimony, I usually like to shock people and begin by saying this. I was saved four years before I was born. Now, before you shout heretic and throw me out with St. Patrick's, let me explain. You see, I have been brought up with an assurance that we serve the God of the impossible. And the God of the impossible will do impossible things. So I want to take you back in time now. And I want you to go back in your mind. Some of you won't be old enough to remember this. But in 1963, my mother was lying in the Royal Victoria Hospital with a terminal brain tumour. And told there's no hope. They said, we can try and operate, but... We can't give you any hope. It's likely you'll be left as a vegetable. That was the words of the doctor. At that time, my uncle, who was training to be a Presbyterian minister, 
it would have been quite uncommon then for Presbyterian ministers or trainee Presbyterian ministers to believe in praying for the sick. Paul confirms that, and he's a Presbyterian. Um, <laughs> and I should like, but my uncle found a man in Belfast who prayed for the sick in the early 60s. A Presbyterian, but not a minister. And brought him to the Royal Victoria Hospital. He prayed with my mother, and the God of the impossible was at work in the Royal Victoria Hospital, and the mother tumour disappeared. Wow. Amen. Instantly disappeared. Amen. Yeah, yeah. The doctors decided to operate anyway because they didn't believe it. And they operated and found nothing. It was gone. Now, why I say I was saved four years before I was born, if my mother had not made it from the brain tumour, I would not have been here. So my life would not have happened. So clearly the enemy perhaps had a plan to take my mother out, and then that would have meant I wouldn't have been here, and then you wouldn't have had to listen to me. (laughs) So the God of the impossible can do impossible things. The story doesn't end there, of course. What I didn't tell you was that the enemy was also trying another tactic to thwart God's plan. And and we see that when God can do the impossible and God can do the impossible and thwart the enemy's plan. So my mother was not able to have children. However, when she was prayed for for the brain tumor, guess what? The barn has disappeared as well. Didn't ask for prayer for that, but it happened at the same time. So even there's things we're not asking God for, he can still do. Now for those who are interested who prayed for my mother, just in case anybody knows the name, the man's name was Mr. Hare. I have never met anyone who knew Mr. Hare until I talked to Brother David. And not surprisingly, Brother David remembers Mr. Hare. Unconventional was what Brother David said. He was a Presbyterian, not a clergyman. And he was in disrepute, or dis- disreputed by many people in the church because he didn't believe in praying for the sick. And also, this particular gentleman still was not known to smoke the odd cigar. God can do impossible things through unexpected people. So I was born in 1967. Um, so I better now tell you that I did become a Christian in my own right. I was saved after being born, of course. Um, and this is where this, this gets interesting, just to join up the story with last week. In 1971, my mother was going to meetings in Randallstown, where Fergus now lives. Those meetings were being conducted by none other than Cecil Stewart 50 years ago. December 22nd, 1971, I was being dragged along every Saturday night to these meetings as a four-year-old. I came back from a meeting in 1971 and said to my mother, do I need to be a Christian at four and a half years of age? That's the question I asked my mother. And she led me to faith in Jesus, having come back from a meeting where Dr. Cecil Stewart preached, who was here last week. So I'm not blood related to Cecil, but you could say that in many ways I have a connection. I didn't see him for, I didn't have any connection with him for 46 years until more recently, and now we have ministry connections and we occasionally have done speaking engagements together. And the fact we plan to go to Italy next year to speak in Italy. So, uh, subject to COVID and travel. Um, as a young man, I, I probably had people saying to me, the call of God is on your life and you should go to Bible college. But for me, that wasn't possible. I had complications with family responsibilities looking after my mother who by that stage had developed a, a different illness, different scenario and um, it wasn't possible for me to go to college and, and, and so I began to develop uh, I was ordained as a lay speaker in my own denomination at the time and for the last 30 years my life has been about serving God either in the work that I did which largely was in consultancy in more recent years but now is entirely working with Christian leaders around the world as Fergus rightly said, it's about encouraging, equipping, and empowering Christian leaders 
whether they lead in the church, the community, or the workplace, we're all called to lead. And if you doubt that, go to Romans 5, 17, just to take a verse to back up what Fergus was saying. It says that we have received grace and righteousness. And if, if I asked you, if, if you're a child of God, have you received the grace of God and the righteousness of Christ Jesus? Your answer would be yes. But there's a second part to that verse, which says, so we can rule and reign in this life through Christ Jesus. And God has given us gifts and abilities to, to rule and reign in this life so we can lead others in the right path, the path of Jesus. Uh, and so that's why my life is dedicated to helping people live and lead like Jesus. 1987, 1986, I was at Queen's University in Belfast. I was working on the summer holidays in a petrol station in good old Kogibaki, where I grew up. And um, I took really ill. I took a pain. I, I really thought, you know, I was 19... I was a bit of a bodybuilder back in the day. I know you can't believe that now. Um, I, I was working with colour gas tanks at the petrol station. I was throwing them about all day. I thought I'd pulled a muscle. But when I lost 13 pound weight in three, three days, I knew I didn't pull a muscle. I had a kidney problem, but I didn't know it at the time. <clears throat> it took six months to get a diagnosis of what had caused the problem in September 20, uh, 1986. February 87, a young Chinese doctor walked into the outpatients in, a, in an appointment room and said, Mr. Stewart, I think you'd better sit down. Now at that stage, you think one thing, cancer. So when they said, you're going to have to lose a kidney, I laughed and I said, is that all? So I want to give thanks to God that first of all, I've lived life longer with one kidney than I did with two. I'm 34 years on one kidney. I did 19, 20 odd years with two. Um, so the kidney was removed, and I tell you that because there's further context. Now, if you know anything about kidney and kidney disease, you'll know that if you have one kidney, you can't afford to have a problem with your second kidney. So in 2003, on an annual review, in the Antrim Hospital, it was discovered that I had a blockage leading to the left kidney. There were stones blocking the lead into the left kidney through your ureter tube. And that's not good news. And the God of the impossible decided to show up again. I went back to church, asked my pastor to pray with me, went back for the second scan and the blockage was gone. But I'm only telling you that to bring you to the next story, which is about how the God of the impossible can do things through unexpected people. Eight years later, 2011, I go back to the hospital for an annual review, and you guessed it, the passageway to the left kidney was again blocked by stones. I went down, and as I'm quite the one to do, I went to come back to the hospital and went for a cup of coffee, because coffee resolves most things. Um, <laughs> and I went to Cafe Nero in Bellamy and I walked in and my good friend Trevor Finley, who Fergus knows said to me well that's just not good enough <laughs> and he left his hand on the table on top of my hand and he says Lord we command the blockage to go I went back to the hospital for the second scan guess what the blockage was gone God will use unusual people in unusual places to allow the impossible to happen. And so I'm a testimony, if you want to put it that way, of multiple miracles. I always say there are five miracles in my life. The miracle of my mother's tumour disappearing. The miracle of my mother's barrenness disappearing. The miracle of new birth in Jesus in 1971. The miracle of a blockage in the kidney disappearing in 2003. And the miracle of a blockage in the kidney disappearing in 2011. But I want to tell you one final story of God doing the impossible in unexpected ways. And this is not a personal story, but it's one I have first-hand um, knowledge of, as it were. 
Uh, one of the things I'm blessed to do is work with Youth for Christ International, both here as the chair of Northern Ireland, but also internationally as their leadership advisor. And uh, I was speaking about two months ago <clears throat> in the gathering of all the directors of Youth for Christ in Europe and the Middle East. All this is done now by Zoom. Don't have to leave Balaminga. I can do it from my office in the back garden. Uh, but I'm speaking uh, on the challenge of leading in difficult times. But they have always on a gathering of the directors of Youth for Christ from those 37 nations in Europe and Middle East. They always have a couple of testimonies. And so this chap appears on the screen called Victor. He's along with the National Director of Youth for Christ in Belarus. What I'm about to describe to you is a modern day miracle. Not a physical healing, but a modern day miracle of deliverance. Earlier this year, Victor, he, he runs a Youth for Christ Centre in a city in Belarus. Now, if you know anything about Belarus right now, the government is a very difficult government to work with. We, you may have heard about the EasyJet flight or the Ryan Air flight being di diverted back into Belarus and the, the other guy taken into captivity and he appeared, with, he'd been beaten up and with, who knows where he is right now. So there were mass street protests happening in this particular city where Victor lives. Victor runs a daycare and youth centre for Youth for Christ in that city, but he's no income. So he works three nights a week, night shift in a biscuit factory. To get to the biscuit factory, he has to take two buses. One takes him to the city centre, the other takes him to the suburb where the biscuit factory is. He gets off the bus one night in the middle of the city centre at 10 o'clock to change buses, a bit like City Hall, we might say, but there's a street protest going on and the police and army round everybody up and put them in the back and arrest them. He gets arrested while waiting for a bus. 20 of them are taken to one prison cell. 20 sharing a cell in a former convent in the city. Each day they're brought out of the prison cell and they're asked to walk what's called the corridor of shame. And as they walk down this corridor, there are guards with cudgels and batons on the other side and they curse them, they spit at them and they beat them with the cudgels. Victor says for the first couple of days he just didn't know what he think. His mind was everywhere. On the third day, <laughs> isn't it funny how God sometimes seems to work on the third day? On the third day, Victor's about to be paraded with everybody else down through the corridor of shame. And he hears the Lord say to him, walk down the corridor of shame, but today I want you to pray the Lord's Prayer out loud. And keep repeating it until you get to the end of the quarter. By the time Victor was at the end of the quarter, every single guard dropped their cudgels and got on their knees. These guards, they may be living in a communist system in Belarus, but they all have a Greek Orthodox background, so they recognize the Lord, Lord's Prayer in their own language. And they got on their knees and they said, we must release this man because a holy man is in our midst. That's 2021. That is God's deliverance for his people in the midst of absolute persecution. So be encouraged. God is in the business right now of doing the impossible. And tonight, whatever your personal situation is, your personal need is, I just want to say that God knows and God sees your need. Um, I'm going to be handing back to Fergus shortly, but I want to do two things before I do. I really sense today, um, and God was speaking to me, but he gave me a particular word today um, about people suffering from the current and the long-term effects of burnout. Burnout is a condition that many people have been affected by for different reasons. I shared um, a little seven points on burnout that the Lord gave me this afternoon with a friend in Scotland, a pastor. And he said, you would never believe this. 
In fact, he says, it would be really good if you sent me that on Argo. And I said, Michael, why on Argo? He says, because I have just written to every pastor in all denominations in Scotland about burnout. And, you know, I just sensed it coming up the road tonight, not to miss that, that there may be those of you here tonight and you're suffering with burnout. And God sees that. And God wants to meet you in your point of need tonight. So before I hand back to Fergus, um, I think I've taken my allotted 15, 20 minutes. Um, Fergus is saying, keep going, keep going. Um, but I, I would like you just to stand for a moment. Uh, um, I, I want to pray with you. <clears throat> so Father, we, we thank you tonight that we are in the presence of a holy God. We thank you, Father, that you are the God of the impossible. We thank you, Father, that you can do the impossible regardless of what man may say. We thank you, Father, that you are the God of the impossible who thwarts the enemy's plans. We thank you, Father, that you are the God who can do the impossible through unexpected people. And we thank you, Father, that you are the God who can do the impossible in unexpected ways. And Father, tonight, we thank you, you're the God who can do the impossible tonight. So Father, as we come to prayer, as we come for the team leading us in a time of prayer for those with needs tonight, Father, we're very sensitive to your Holy Spirit. And Father, we ask that as we join our faith together and declare that this is a night when God will do the impossible, even here in St. Patrick's, Bally McCarrot, on the Newton Arts Road, on the 3rd of June, 2021, we thank you that the day of the impossible is not over. We thank you that the day of the impossible is now. And so, Father, we bring the needs of every person in this room, spoken and unspoken, known and unknown to you, Father. And we ask as we draw close to you, Father, that you and the, through the power of the Holy Spirit will cause the impossible to happen even here tonight. For those, Father, who have suffered from burnout and the effects of burnout, be that stress, fatigue, paralysis, depression, whatever it might be, Father, we speak a special word of healing right now and we release by faith a word to say that people are being healed even right now where they stand in their pews, Father, from every symptom of burnout in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for listening to this brief um, talk. Thank you, Fergus, for inviting and the introduction. Um, we pray that God will bless the rest of our time tonight.